So first, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Ruth B. Phillips from Carleton University in Ottawa. Ruth Phillips holds a Canada Research Chair and is Professor of Art History at Carleton University, Ottawa. Her research focuses on the indigenous arts of North America and critical museology. Her books include Museum Pieces Toward the Indigenization of Canadian Museums from 2011 and Trading Identities, the Souvenir in Native North American Art from the Northeast. With co-author Janet Catherine Burlow, she has recently published the expanded second edition of Native North American Art for Oxford University Press. Phillips has served as director of the University of British Columbia's Museum of Anthropology and is pres president of CIHA, the International Committee on the History of Art. She is a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, so please join me in welcoming Ruth Phillips. Thank you, PJ, and thank you so much to the organizers of the symposium, to Crystal Bridges, uh, for this wonderful invitation I've wanted to visit for ever since you opened, and it's, it's a real privilege to be here. And I also like to thank the questioners who started us off because they've introduced some of the issues that I and others on this panel will be addressing. The travelers and settlers who created the rich array of paintings brought together in this exhibition were heirs to a European tradition which pictures land as landscape. The curators show us how this tradition evolved in the Americas in all its variety as artists responded to environments and historical contexts as diverse as the Amazonian rainforest and the ice fields of the Arctic. Their new world was, of course, already old. It had been home to indigenous peoples who had been in the Americas for more than 15,000 years, who had developed their own highly varied ways of representing land in visual art. I want today to sample these alternative ways of visualizing land by looking with you at artworks made by indigenous artists in North America. They relate to the works in the exhibition in two different ways, the earlier examples as complements and the more recent ones as critiques. Both, however, lead us to make a distinction between representations of land and of landscape, which will lie at the heart of my discussion. As we will see, although very few representations of landscape are found in traditional Native American arts, in one way or another, virtually all Native American arts are about land in the sense that they situate human beings and their terrestrial world in relation to the cosmic forces that empower life on Earth. I am much indebted to the curators for inviting me to participate in several meetings organized to refine the exhibition's themes. I learned a great deal from these discussions, and they also challenged me to think about the difficulties that arise when we try to represent Native American art through standard art historical genres and time periods. The genres of post-Renaissance Western painting, the history painting, the portrait, the still life, the landscape, are largely alien to traditional Native American arts. Visual artistic creativity has more often been stimulated by clothing, weapons, ceremonial structures and implements, and the land itself. And you saw that in the slide before of the great medicine wheel in Montana. The time period of the exhibition from the early 19th century to the early 20th is equally problematic, for it ends just before it became possible for aspiring Native American artists to enter art schools and acquire training in the media and formats of Western art. Indeed, the century covered by the exhibition coincides with the darkest period in post-contact Native American history. During the 19th and early 20th centuries in much of North America, indigenous peoples lost almost all their land, were confined to reservations, and saw their children removed to boarding and residential schools designed to forcibly hasten their assimilation into settler society. 
The modern and contemporary Native American artists who have worked in the genre of landscape painting have tended to use it to recover spiritual connections and identities associated with ancestral lands from which they have been alienated and to draw attention to the desecration of these lands. And that's, you see in this painting by Lawrence Paul Yaxville Upton. For many of these 20th and 21st century artists, in other words, the painting of landscape has offered a site for contesting key premises and concepts which inform many of the works shown in Picturing the Americas. To illustrate the divergences and intersections of these indigenous and settler art histories, I'll devote the first part of my paper to representations of land in Native American arts, which are continuous with pre-contact art forms, iconographies, and concepts of aesthetic expression. In the second part, I'll step outside the time frame of the exhibition itself to discuss several works by modern and contemporary Native American artists, which, while conforming to the conventions of landscape painting, also resist some of its most fundamental premises. Although many of my examples are drawn from the Great Lakes region, which I know best, the fundamental dynamics they represent are found throughout Native North America. In Western art, the landscape depicts a discrete place on the Earth's surface as seen from a fixed vantage point. In contrast, in traditional indigenous cosmologies, the, visual, the visible topography of the Earth is an interface between two great cosmic zones, the sky world and the realm beneath the Earth's surface. It is a space of mediation where humans may encounter the other than human beings who inhabit these zones and acquire from them powers that humans need to survive and prosper. At exceptional moments, a shaman or a person embarked on a vision quest may, with the aid of the other than human beings, leave the surface world of Earth to travel through sky and under worlds. Travel and mobility are thus multi-directional, structured vertically by the axis mundi, linking the cosmic tiers, and horizontally by the four cardinal directions. In the Great Lakes region, which I know best, places where sky, water, and the world below its surface meet have been regarded as habitations of the great thunderbirds who govern the sky world and the powerful underwater beings who inhabit the realms below surfaces of earth and water. Vision seekers have fasted to invoke the pity of these beings on high cliffs or in caves where sheer rock surfaces descend dramatically into the lake and river shores. And they have marked these places with paintings of the beings who have blessed them with power. In the 17th century, for example, the warrior shaman Miengun painted an image of the Mishipeshu, the underwater being who had created storms in the lake and overturned the canoes carrying a party of invading Iroquois, and this is at the Agawa site on the north shore of Lake Superior. This image can, I would argue, be understood as a representation of a place in the land, visualized in terms of its most significant feature, the power that resides in it. When the Ojibwe missionary and historian George Copway traveled in the same region in the 1840s, he was told a related story by a woman named Shawonaqua, who described her own vision quest. After fasting for 10 days, 10 days in a cave under a rocky ledge, she was finally rewarded, quote, in the midst of a great thunderstorm, she slept and dreamed. Numerous individuals surrounded her. They sang a song, then left with the exception of one who it appeared remained to reveal to her the purport of what she saw, unquote. The man transformed into a bald eagle and took her high up where she could see the earth spread out below. He explained that the scene represented the different stages of life and he gave her a song with which to summon the thunderers when she needed their power. In this narrative, the long view of land becomes the long view of her life and the powers in the land are revealed as healing medicines. Shawonaqua did not, as far as we know, make a rock painting to commemorate this vision and honor the spirits, but such a woman would have recorded her dreams in the media of birch bark and beadwork. The medicine powers of plants might be visualized in a beaded bandolier bag, while the animating powers, 
of the Thunderbirds might be visualized in the abstract designs scratched into the surface of a birch bark container. On the example on the right, the lightning flashes that signal the pleasant presence of thunderers descend from the rim as triangular wing forms inscribed with bold zigzags, and their thunderbird symbolism is confirmed by the figurative um, uh, representations. There are two thunderbirds right there on the bottom of the uh, basket, where they wouldn't be seen by an average viewer, but, but would be present to confirm the power that is expressed through this seemingly decorative geometric design. In Shawanaqua's account, as elsewhere in the Americas, traditional indigenous visual arts require accompaniments of dance, song, music, ritual, and narrative to make their historical, social, and moral meanings fully comprehensible. When, for example, an Alaskan Yupik shaman wore one of the masks which were so admired as primitive art by the surrealist artists of the 1930s, he did so in the gajgig, or men's communal house, as a component of a celebration in which he related to his community his travels to negotiate with the supernatural controllers of the lands, animals, and resources. In the complex, dramatized performances of the ritual dance, whose name translates as Our Way of Praying, the mask's visual imagery was made meaningful through the creative work of dancers, drummers, and singers. As Teresa Arifgak John has explained, quote, masks of bearded seal, moose, wolf, eagle, beaver, fish, and the north wind were accompanied with drums and music. The process of negotiation started with distant travel to various world dimensions of the animals to conduct critical discourses, unquote. Lands, winds, animals, spirits, and humans are inseparably interlinked in such representations. But something approaches, approaching the Western idea of landscape may also be intended, and I quote again. Traditionally, it was a common practice for the shamans to take short trips to the moon, to seek personal reflective time and to work with the spirits. The Yukon River Moon Dance is a revealing song about an actual account of an event that took place on the moon. The shaman composer sat on the moon while he enjoyed the beautiful view of Earth, unquote. When represented to the community in Nagakshi, the shaman wore a wooden mask representing the moon, but the landscape he saw was revealed through narrative, song, and dance. The ritual centering of the body in relation to these forces is described in visual art by motifs incorporating crosses, circles, and concentric forms that may look abstract to our eyes, and marked also in the performance of rituals through structured movements and gestures. Such ritual movements are exemplified by the pipe ceremony of the plains and the woodlands, in which the celebrant begins by making offerings of smoke to the four directions. An, an artist... Um, pictured the summoning of the Thunderbirds through a pipe ceremony on a magnificent 19th century drum in which the pictorial space is almost totally occupied by the great beings in their sky world. The human supplicant's relative insignificance and the insignificance of the surface of the earth is signaled by his positioning at the bottom standing on a tiny strip of land. All these forms, in all these forms of expressive culture, land is affirmed as the essential ground where the fundamental interdependencies of humans, animals, plants, and other than human beings and, are essential, and essential forms are played out through forms of embodiment and ritual activation. Euro-American landscape paintings cannot capture these indigenous experiences and intellectual traditions because they privilege discrete rather than holistic vantage points and are made for contemplation rather than activation. They have rather inscribed settler commodifications of land and are inevitably implicated in contingent projects of indigenous dispossession. A rare visual depiction of earthly topography occurs on an early 19th century deerskin bag dating to around 1800. With extraordinary delicacy, the Anishinaabe woman who made it <clears throat> used dyed porcupine quills to embroider across the middle the undulating contours of hills and waters. 
Here, the profile view of the Earth's surface serves not so much to describe the land as to demarcate the boundary that separates the zones of upper and underworld power shown on the two sides. The great thunderbird rises above a broad red earth line on one side, wings spread wide, while on the other, turtles and horned serpents populate the lower realms. The two surfaces of such bags layer over each other to construct a model of cosmic power organized along both vertical and horizontal axes. In contrast to the two-dimensionality of the European landscape painting tradition, they bring into alignment and tension two zones whose opposed and complementary powers energize the universe. In many parts of the Americas, land is also represented through the images of the totemic ancestors who conferred on their descendants the knowledge and rights to use particular places in the land. Such totemic representations are most famously associated with North Co West Coast peoples who display totemic ancestors in on a monumental scale on totem poles and also on masks, robes, and other ceremonial possessions. A robe belonging to the Yakutat Clinket Wakwan clan, for example, represents one of its most important crests, Mount St. Elias, which figured importantly in the account of their migration to their present lands. As ethnographer Frederica de Laguna explained, quote, its snowy triangular peak, 18,000 feet high, served to guide them on their journey across the ice from Copper River, unquote. The associated Kwakwan origin story, origin story also identifies particular halibut fishing grounds, seal-rich waters, and other places in the land where ancestral beings struggled and intermarried with other clans and to which this clan uh, claims uh, authority through this totem and its image. Despite attempts by missionaries and governments to suppress the potlatch, the major occasion for the display of totemic imagery, Northwest Coast peoples continued to show their ancestral beings and to fight for the land rights they represent. And there's a, a, a photograph of Skidigit with the monumental totem poles which represent very similar uh, imagistic systems. Similarly, in the Southwest, Pueblo peoples persisted in performing the annual ceremonies centering on the dances of the Katsinam, the benevolent spirits inhabiting the surrounding mountains who bring blessings of rain and fertility to the land and the people it sustains. In the Southwest during the 1920s, artists like Fred Cabote adopted the conventions of Western pictorial representation, and here are two other examples um, by other artists, uh, to, um, on their, as settings for ceremonial dances and on their own. Yet in the classes that were held at the Santa Fe Indian School, teacher Dorothy Dunn discouraged such depictions, urging on the artists uh, the use of the blank, blank background and simplified folk art style considered authentic for primitive artists. The, uh, and here you see, this was one of Dorothy Dunn's examples of what not to do, and it's very clearly indicated in the text written on it, and this is what they were supposed to do. So no, no background landscape. The depiction of landscape per se remained the purview in this period of contemporary settler artists like Marsden Hartley and Georgia O'Keeffe who were working in the Southwest during the same years. The first generation of Native American artists to receive professional art training came of age after World War II. Nishnabe painter George Morrison spent his early years at Grand Portage, Minnesota, and won a scholarship to the New York's Art Students League in the 1940s. Although he worked in the prevailing abstract expressionist style of those years, his interest in landscape was evident from that early period. But it was not until he returned to teach in Minnesota in 1970 and became active in the American Indian movement that his landscape painting became overtly a way of exploring Nishinaabe concepts of spiritual presence in land. And I quote Morrison, as I look back on my childhood, it was a time of transition. Indians had lost the best of the old world and could not fully cope with the new one. White civilization was encroaching on our lives. We attended white schools and were taught to imitate white people's ways. Our old mystical rites were no longer being performed. 
Remnants of an old life survived, however. Fragments of the superstitions and lore I heard as a child stayed with me." Unquote. The political activism of the 1960s and 70s liberated Morrison to claim his indigenous identity, to return to his childhood homelands at Grand Portage, where he and his wife bought a house, uh, built a house they named Red Rock on the shores of Lake Superior. Morrison's Red Rock variations are a series of landscapes rendered in the vocabulary of abstract expressionism, and he articulated the quest they embody. Quote, I seek the power of the rock, the magic of the water, the religion of the tree, the color of the wind, and the enigma of the horizon." Unquote. At the end of his life, Morrison added a further element to these landscapes, which, as Gerald Visner has suggested, bring us back to the concepts of place and power embodied in pre-contact Nishinaabe rock paintings, to the imagery, perhaps, painted at Agawa by the shaman warrior Miengun. Morrison was clear about the references of these organic shapes, quote, individual titles often use the idea of spirit forms. All those shapes and things that come from the images can relate to spirits. The shapes might suggest objects in the lake coming out of the water. Often they're irregular, shaped like amoeba, an amoeba, organic forms that relate to clouds or puddles, unquote. The Canadian Nishinaabe painter Robert Houle is a generation younger than Morrison but he shares the older artist's affirmation of animate presence in the land. Houle engaged with modernism as an art student in Montreal and was particularly drawn to the abstract expression of Barnett Newman. In an important 1980s curatorial essay, he urged the need for a new generation of indigenous artists to invent a modern language of magic and symbolism grounded in ancient shamanistic practices. Quote, being modernists, they carry the privilege of appropriating bits of their traditional and contemporary cultures to form an amalgam strictly reflective of their own identity." Unquote. The exploration of spiritual presence in the land has been central to his own work. The title of his four-canvas work, The Place Where God Lives in the National Gallery of Canada, for example, translates and reclaims the original Anishinaabe name for his home community and province. And I quote Houle. There is a spiritual place in Manitoba known as the Narrows of Lake Manitoba, where the water beating against the resonant limestone cliff and pounding along the pebbled shore creates the sound of Kimishonisnaug, literally, our ancestors, believed to be the voice of Manitou. It was and still is a sacred place, a power place, whose hierophantic messages compel the Soto who continue to live nearby to offer tobacco and many travel to it seeking renewal, as a Muslim will travel to Mecca. To the Soto, the Narrows are known as Manitowaban, meaning the divine straits, or the place where God lives." Unquote. Cree artist Kent Monkman's repaintings of the 19th century corpus of Charles Russell, Frederick Remington, and others exemplify the more overtly contestatory and critical engagement of Native American artists with the settler landscape tradition. Monkman came to the art world attention during the 1990s rather, with a series of meticulously executed repaintings of the romantic 19th century depictions of Indian life that are the Beaux-Arts equivalents of Curtis's photographs, and I showed you one earlier. His key strategy of subversion is a homoerotic inversion of the messages of white male dominance these paintings convey. These figures here uh, are, are what I'm referring to. White men appear in the positions usually occupied by Indians, eroticized, seduced, and objectified, and they become disempowered, passive, and mesmerized. Monkman came to prominence uh, uh, through the, such paintings uh, and imitating the work of Albert Bierstadt, George Catlin, Paul Kane, and the artists of the Hudson River School. In keeping with his early training as an illustrator and his work as a set and costume designer, the artist shows us what it would mean to switch roles on the stage of history that has been constructed in the Western imagination by this landscape painting tradition. In his Trappers of Men in the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts, closely based on Bierstadt's Among the Sierra Nevada Mountains, California of 1868. Uh, he, he works out these problems. 
In this and other paintings, Monkman subverts the messages of white male dominance by inserting men into these um, uh, subordinate positions. So working within the colonizing traditions of landscape painting, Monkman's um, painting inverts colonial narratives of power and possession. In discussing these late 20 and 20th and early 20th century works, I have transgressed the boundaries of the exhibition in order to call attention to the challenges facing art history, museums, scholars, and curators as they seek to make our representations of arts histories more inclusive. As the currents of globalization make the world smaller and our societies ever more diverse, we are moving toward a world art history in which we can productively engage with the kinds of dialogues I have summarized here. Such a project cannot and should not diminish the achievements of any one tradition, but rather by bringing different ways of thinking about land or any other artistic subject into dialogue, we come to appreciate even more richly the diverse ways in which human beings in the Americas have thought about land, history, and their animating powers. Thank you. <laughs>